All right, for this exercise, we are going to um, schedule or schedule a brand new patient to come in and be seen. When we search for this patient, they are not going to be in APM. They have never been seen anywhere UK before. So the searches that we do will look in both systems. We won't find that patient. We will move on to get the registration folder completed and then we will be able to schedule the appointment, okay? But in the mornings when you come in, you're gonna open up your folder so that you can toggle between the folders as you need. Um, over on the left-hand side, you've got your functions, then you see practice management, and then you see patient management, scheduling, financial processing, and system administration. We are not gonna open up the financial processing folder today. That is where we will create a batch under the transactions folder, but we will do that tomorrow. Uh, when we check a patient in. We're gonna use the patient management and scheduling folder. So I want you to click the drop down to the right of patient management. There are two folders that you're gonna use under patient management, the registration folder and the notes folder. The notes folder, um, we're not going to create a note on a patient in this video. Um, in your manual, you do have information in there about creating notes on patients. Uh, check with your manager if you're going to be one that creates a note on a patient that causes it to pop up when someone accesses that patient. Uh, check with them to see if you're one of the people in your area that's going to create notes. Uh, you may not. Documents folder, we don't use here at UK. We want to open the registration folder. I'm going to single left click on the word registration. That will open up my registration folder in this um, big gray area. You now see the registration folder. You see the word registration, then you see the tabs that are within the registration folder, okay? Now I'm gonna go back over here to the left where it says patient management and click that little arrow up. You only need one registration folder open. Don't open multiple registration folders. If you do, it's gonna confuse the system and you. What you see in one registration folder, you will not see in another registration folder. You only need one registration folder open, okay? Now, Back over here under functions, practice management, scheduling, we're gonna click that drop down. Now, before we um, right click on a folder so that we can keep our registration folder open and toggle back to it when we need to, you've got appointment scheduling, scheduling activities and scheduling reports. Um, I don't believe we're using the referrals folder here. Appointment scheduling is where you're going to go in and schedule the patient's appointments. Um, you also have a couple other tabs in there, the appointment activity tab. Uh, where all of the patient's appointments are housed. Again, that APM view only printing WBT covered what's in each of these folders. The scheduling activities and scheduling reports, the printing part of that view only and printing WBT covered those two folders. Now, I want to open up my appointment scheduling so that I keep my registration folder open. I'm going to right click on the word appointment scheduling. Make sure you right click. If you single click, it's not gonna open up both. Um, it'll open up the folder, but it kicks you out of the registration folder. So you're gonna right click on that and you're gonna come down and select open appointment scheduling in a new window. And then if you look up here, you're in the patient scheduling appointment scheduling folder and you see the tabs within that folder. If you look to the left, there's your registration folder. I'm gonna go back over here and click that arrow up to close the scheduling folder. Um, because I only need one scheduling folder open. I'm in the scheduling folder. I wanna to go to the registration folder. I'm gonna go click on the word registration directly to the left of patient scheduling, appointment scheduling. I will click on that and it will take me to my registration folder. I wanna go back to my scheduling folder. I come back up here and I click on patient scheduling, appointment scheduling. That's how you set these folders up so that you can actually toggle when you need to. Okay, the APM view and printing WBT also talked about these icons that are on your toolbar up here, okay? There's not a lot of those that we will use. Um, some of them you'll never touch. But um, if you look across your icons and you're just glancing, do you see one that looks like a bloodshot eyeball? It's actually this red arrow pointing to the left with looks like three little lashes flying out. If you hover, it says log off. That is the proper way to log out of APM once you've logged in. Do not go over here and hit the X to close that. Um, if you do, it will close the system but not log you out. If you try to log back in, 
you're going to get an error that you're already logged in. You'll either call the help desk, they will go and boot you out of the system so you can get logged back in, or you can shut down your computer and restart it, and that will kick you out, and then you can get logged back in, okay? Um, the other icon I want to talk about is this gear icon. Now, we're not going to do it in class, but if you click that, um, it says update options. If you click that, you can set some defaults. So it'll make your life in, in APM a little bit easier. We're not going to set any of these in class, but in the live system. There are three tabs within the update options icon. First one is scheduling. You want to come down and um, select your scheduling department so that when you're scheduling an appointment, the schedule department field will automatically complete with your department. You don't have to go search for it. Okay. Scheduling location, do not set a scheduling location. Um, you are going to have to get that training from your specific department. Each department has different scheduling locations that that department uses. Not only are they physical locations, they are specialties and teams within your department. I use the example of ophthalmology. Uh, you could go in for a routine eye exam, but they also have specialists that not only will do an, an eye exam, um, they also can do cataract. If you have a cataract issue, retina issues, glaucoma issues, those are specialties, okay? So when you go to schedule an appointment, you have to have your scheduling location based on the type of the appointment the patient needs and what resource you're scheduling that appointment for. What locations does that resource use? Does that make sense? Uh, you might have 10 different locations for your department as a whole, and you've got 15 or 20 providers in your department but not all of them use all of the locations that are set up for your department. Uh, resource, we don't recommend that you set a resource. You're not gonna be scheduling for one provider every time. You have different providers in your department that you'll be scheduling for. Um, so we recommend that you don't set that. Same with coverage type. Depending on what the patient is being seen for determines the coverage type. Coverage type is extremely important when it comes to the billing. In the policies tab, you're gonna see that when you enter an insurance plan, you have to pick a coverage type there. So if they're coming in for a motor vehicle appointment, you're gonna schedule the appointment under motor vehicle. In the policies tab, you have to make sure you have a plan listed with the coverage type of motor vehicle. So when this motor vehicle appointment hits the billing system, it goes to the policy tab and bills the coverage the plan that has the coverage type of motor vehicle. Same with medical, if they're coming in for a medical appointment, same thing. Workers' comp, research. Coverage type is extremely important. Um, and then if you click on batches, if you're going to uh, check patients in, it is your responsibility if their patient, if their insurance requires that they pay a copay to collect that copay at, at their visit, okay? Um, you have to have a batch opened before you can collect a copay. So as far as batch type, yours will always, always be payment, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and select that, but I'm not gonna save this. So I'll click on payment so I can get my batch category. Now somebody's already set a default in training um, when batch type is selected to fill in this batch category, 800 surgery plastics CSA. If that is not your department, you don't want to open your batch under that batch category. When I click that drop down, there are a lot of options here. You're going to see your department on here. So if I was in um, ophthalmology, then I would need to make sure that my batch category, when I created it, is set for ophthalmology. Same for psychiatry. See, they have a couple different psychiatry <laughs> batch categories. You need to know which one you are actually taking that payment under and make sure you have the correct batch category selected. Um, printers, you don't need to do anything with printers. It's gonna automatically um, print to the printer that has been used for that computer, okay? If for some reason that computer, that printer is not going to the printer that you want, you can call the help desk and they can make that change. I'm gonna click cancel and go back to my uh, APM. Okay, so we are going to now search for the patient who has called in that wants to schedule an appointment. They are brand new to UK Healthcare. 
Um, but we are still going to search for them to make sure that they are actually brand new to UK healthcare and are not already in the system with the medical record number. Okay. Now, if you have your manual, it's highly recommended that you um, follow the manual the first couple of times you go to register a brand new patient so that you can follow the steps in the manual um, and you won't miss anything and you'll get that patient registered correctly, which creates a medical record number for them. You go to page 11 in your manual, searching for a patient. There are three ways to search for a patient. Um, medical record number, social security number, patient name and date of birth, okay? Now, we're on this patient scheduling tab within the appointment scheduling folder. That's where you're gonna live when you're scheduling appointments. Where it says patient, there's a free text box. I don't recommend that you click in there and type anything because you need to click one of these icons. Um, but let's talk about the icons before we actually click it. The first one is the binocular. That is actually what you're going to click to every time to search for a patient. Icon to the right of that is a magic wand. Please don't ever click that magic wand. You will bypass searching for your patients, start adding them as a new patient. You do not want to do that until you've searched for them and made sure they're not in the system, okay? So usually we ignore that uh, magic wand icon right here. The last icon, if you hover, usually if you hover on it, it says memo appointment. In your manual, there's instructions on how to do a memo appointment. Um, we're not gonna do that in this exercise. I want everybody to go ahead and click on their binocular and that will bring up the patient lookup box. Now, mine defaults to patient name and date of birth, but let's say the patient calls in and they have a medical record number. What's the odds of that? Not very likely at all. But if for some reason you have the medical record number, you can search for the patient using the medical record number. You would need to change your search by. Now, I will tell you, I'm not a fan of these drop downs. I'm going to click the drop down and show you. Look at all these options that are in here that you can choose. If you use any, anything other than medical record number, social security number, patient name, and date of birth, it will only look locally in APM for your patient. It will not search both systems. We want to ensure that we're looking first locally in APM for this patient. If they've been pulled into APM, we will find them. They will be in the results area. We click on them to select them, click OK, and we go schedule the appointment. And then we move to the registration folder and verify everything in that registration folder, including insurance. If they are not found, um, in, in here, we actually will go through the process to create them as new. But let's say I want, I have the medical record number, that's the search I wanna perform. Instead of having my drop down open, I'm gonna click right there where it says patient name and I'm gonna type an M. It's gonna change it to medical record number. If I had that drop down open, even though I scrolled down the medical record number, I would have to click on it to select that. Otherwise, it turns this field red and confuses the system and you got to go reselect it. I think it's easier just to click in that field and type the M and you will get medical record number. When you're searching by medical record number, don't have any other search parameter filled out. So search by two, I want you to click in there and hit, hit your delete key. Make sure you delete that out, okay? And then to the far right, search for. This is where you're gonna enter the medical record number that you want to use to search for your patient. Now, some of UK's medical record numbers are only seven or eight digits long. You need to use uh, nine digits in this field. So you would have to put one or two leading zeros in front to make it none. Now in the training database that we're using, there's only one medical record number. So we're all gonna enter the same number. Um, I want you to type zero, three, 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 six, 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 six. Now we have a button that says local search in the training database, the live system, you have one button that says search all sources. You're either gonna click that search button or hit your enter key. Either way is gonna work. Down at the bottom in the results area, I have Isabella Cullen, okay? That is not the patient I'm gonna use for this exercise. That's just an example to show you how to use social uh, medical record number to search for a patient. All right, let's say you want to search for the patient by their social. That's the second search that we use at UK. I'm going to go back up here to search by where it says medical record number. I'm going to click right there and I'm going to type an S. 
it's going to change it to social security number. Instead of clicking the drop down and scrolling down and finding it off the drop down and selecting it, I just click in there and type what I want. And then to the far right, you need to enter the social security number. Um, we're all going to use the, the same social security number. So let's enter 265-49-4545. 265-49-4545. You don't need to put the dashes in there. You can if you want to. I'm going to hit my enter key and I found Isabella Cullen. Now, I'm going to go up here. You guys just watch the screen on this and change this social. And I get no matching records when I enter that social. Do not assume that if you search for a patient by their social, that they are brand new. Prior to going live with APM, the social security number in our other systems was not a required field. In APM, it is a required field. We cannot leave it blank. We've got to have a number in the social security number field. And we'll talk about the default numbers when we actually get in to the registration folder adding our patient. Um, you could search for a patient that was seen prior to us going live with APM by their social and not find them. That doesn't mean that they are not in the system. It could be that they're in the system either with one of the default numbers that we use, or they were seen prior to us going live with APM and the field was left blank and the system generated a number. Good luck trying to figure out what that number is. Um, so you're not gonna find them with that actual social because they're not in the system with it. If that's the case, move on to your third search, which is search by, click right there where it says SSN. I'm gonna type a P and I will get patient name. Be careful there if you use the drop down. there's an option for patient name and patient number. Sometimes people will pick patient number and then when they enter in the search for field the patient's name, they get an error because we're putting a name where you said to search by number. All right, in the search by two, click in there and type a D. You have to have, if you're searching for a patient by their name, you have to add the date of birth. So in the search by field, you have to have patient name. In the search by two, you have to have date of birth. Now to the far right of the patient name where that social is, I'm gonna click right there and you are gonna enter the patient's last name that's, that you're using to create as a new patient today. You have to capitalize the first letter of the last name and you have to type out the full last name. Directly after the last name, you have to put a comma. It's up to you whether you put a space between the comma and the first name. It doesn't matter if you do or you don't. Then you have to enter the first name and you have to capitalize the, full, the first letter of the first name and you have to do the full first name. So full last name, capitalize the first letter of the last name, comma directly after, space or not, full first name, capitalize the first letter of the first name. Every time you search for a patient, please enter that name with, that, with those credentials or type it in using that format. Otherwise, you're only going to be looking in APM. It will not go out to HQPM and look for this patient. Now, you have to have the date of birth when you're searching by the patient's name. So directly under the pa uh, patient's name in the search for field, I'm going to type in the birthday that I'm using for my patient. You have to have eight digits, two for the month, two for the date, four for the year. You don't need the dashes. You can put them in there if you want. I leave them out. Two less clicks that I have to do. And then I'm gonna hit my enter key. I got no matching records for the patient that I'm going to create as a brand new patient. Remember, scenario is this patient called in, they're brand new to UK. One, I didn't have a medical record number to search for them, so I could skip that search. Two, I looked for them by their social, I didn't find them, didn't mean that they're not in the system. I went on to the third search, which is the patient name and date of birth. Now, my patient is a female. In your manual, um, those three searches that we just did is all that's in your manual. But if your patient is a female, I would go one step further and ask them if there's a maiden name or any other last name that they could have been seen under and search for them with that name. Because it's very possible that as a baby, their parents brought them to the UK emergency room. They're now grown up and they don't remember that. They don't ever remember coming to UK, so they're telling you, no, I've never been seen them. But they could have been seen as a baby under a maiden name or a different last name. You won't find them unless you use that name to search for them. Does that make sense? Okay, 
Now, did anybody get any results on their patient? So this means that this patient doing those three searches has searched both systems. They are not in either of our UK systems, APM or HQPM, as ever having been seen as a patient. So we're gonna to have to create them, uh, create the registration folder before we can move on and schedule the appointment, okay? So this box at the bottom, this button at the bottom that says new patient, go ahead and click on that. That is gonna open up your registration window through a companion window. Now, it's gonna automatically um, bring this box up. What I wanna say is if I was in the scheduling folder, search for my patient, if I didn't click that new patient button and I click directly on the registration folder, I would have to fill in the search for that patient again. Um, but I'm in the scheduling folder. I'm gonna come back to the scheduling folder once I've registered this patient, did, completed the registration folder on this patient. So once I complete the registration folder, I'll come directly back to the patient scheduling folder and my patient will be in context. I won't have to look them up again to schedule the appointment. Does that make sense? All right, now, social security number. I want you to turn your manual to page 12. Um, before we enter anything in this field, um, there are default numbers that we use in APM in the place of someone's social security number. So at this point, I'm gonna ask the patient, what is your social? If they say, ooh, I don't have it memorized, I don't have it handy. Or if I'm calling for my child and I don't have my child's social security number memorized, that's not gonna stop us from doing the registration folder and proceeding on. We're gonna use one of these default numbers. If you look in your manual, the first default number is all eights. And it's, if the patient does not have a valid social security number, and the example there would be if they are a foreign patient. <laughs> foreign patients don't use social security numbers. They don't have them. You're gonna use all eights, okay? The next, next default number that you would use is all sixes. Um, at time of registration, the patient has a social security number, but it's not available. They don't have it memorized or they don't have it handy. You will use all sixes. The next, next default number that you would use is all threes. If the patient says, I'm not going to give you my social, you don't need it, I'm not giving it to you, you will use all threes. It's their right to refuse to give it to us. Uh, but we have to put something in that field because it's shaded yellow. It's a required field. We can't leave it blank. So we'll use all threes. And the last example is all threes in the last four. So if the patient says, okay, I'll give you the last four digits, but not all of it. You will use all threes in the last four digits of their social. Now, also in your manual, it tells you why we need the social security number. Um, this information is needed to positively identify the correct patient. So it's a piece of information we use to identify that patient. Not only their date, patient name and date of birth, social security number helps us identify that patient. For patient safety, to make sure that we have the correct patient up. And billing, this is the, the big one. Um, if we do not have the patient's social security number in our system, they have insurance, they have probably given their insurance company their social security number because it may be required for that plan. If we put a default number in APM, and when we go to bill that insurance, one of the pieces of information that goes with that bill is the social security number to identify that the patient that's covered under that plan is the patient that we're seeing. If those numbers don't match, the insurance company will deny the claim. The patient will then get a bill for their services, okay? So if your patient refuses to give you their social, Explain to them why we need it. It's more for their benefit than it is ours. Yes, it helps us identify the patient, the correct one, but it also ties in with the billing system. If the patient doesn't have the social security number handy when you're completing the registration, please tell them when you come in for your appointment, bring your social security number because we don't want you to end up getting a bill for your services. If they have an insurance that we're contracted with, we are more than happy to bill that insurance plan for this visit but if we don't have the correct social security number, it's gonna get denied, okay? Now, I want you guys to type in the um, social security number that you're gonna use for your patient. Now, in the live system, you will never make up information. You will always ask the patient for the information and enter what they tell you. 
if they don't have that information in your manual, there are uh, defaults that you will use in the place of that information if you cannot get it, okay? All right, tab to the last name. You're gonna enter the patient's last name only, full last name, capitalized first letter of the last name, and then don't put a comma, just the last name. Now, let's talk about naming conventions before we go any further. If you look on page 13, um, it talks about um, hyphenated names. If your patient has a hyphen in their name, we do not use punctuation or special characters in the system. There are some fields that we can use the forward slash in, but I'll explain those fields when we get there. Um, but in the last name, we can't use any punctuation or special characters. So if they have a hyphenated name, you will enter it like this. You will put a space instead of the hyphen, okay? Um, if they have an apostrophe in their name, you will not enter the apostrophe. You will instead enter it all as one, no space in between. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, tab to the first name. You're gonna enter your patient's first name, full first name, capitalize the first letter of the first name. And then skip the middle initial field for now and go to the birthday. Enter the birthday that you're gonna use for your patient eight digits, two for the month, two for the day, four for the year. And then you're gonna click okay. It's gonna bring you to the patient tab in the registration companion window. It's filled in that social. I'm gonna hit my tab key. It's gonna bring me to the last name. Make sure I've got that in there correctly. This is the first entry for this patient. I wanna make sure all this information is correct. Tab to the first name. Now, in your manual, if your patient has a, a suffix with their name, it goes to the right of the first name in that field. So if your patient has a junior as a suffix, you will enter it that way. First name space, suffix. If it's a senior, if it's the first, second, or third, that's how you enter that. If they don't have a suffix, you do not enter it because there's not one to enter Hit your tab key, it skips over this little box right here, which is actually the middle initial field. And then it also skips over the suffix field. We don't use the suffix field in APM. All the information we put in APM, is gonna start flowing downstream through other systems once you save it. Some of those other systems don't have fields that match with APM. So that's why we have to put the suffix with the first name. So as it starts flowing down through those other systems, it gets to the right field, okay? Now, middle name, you're gonna ask the patient, do you have a middle name? If they tell you no, ask them, do you have a middle initial? Because they could possibly have just a middle initial for their middle name. We have to get their full legal name. So everybody go ahead and give their patient a middle name. Capitalize the first letter. If they, if they only have a middle initial, you just type that middle initial there. And notice that it filled it in right here for you. Okay, any questions on how to enter a patient's name? All right, I'm gonna to go to address one. Page 13 talks about the patient tab address one. Um, you're gonna enter the address per the United States Postal Service standards, which is in address one, street number and name only. Live system, you're gonna ask the patient for their address and enter what they tell you. In the training database today, you're gonna to make that address up. When you do the street, the drive, the avenue, here you put a, do not put a period at the end of it. Abbreviate it, but do not put a period, okay? Um, tab two, address two. Address two is for apartment, suite, unit, uh, PO. Do not use punctuation. You can abbreviate. So if they have an apartment number, you can abbreviate that, but don't put a period and don't put a number sign. Just put the number. Does that make sense? Now, as far as city and state, I am not going to click in the city field and type in the city and then pick the state and then type in the zip code. I wanna use the zip code trick to go look and see is that city and state already in the zip code table? If it is, I'm gonna pick it off of the table. I don't want to enter it again because it will add it to the table again. And if it's already there, it doesn't need to be added again. We don't need Lexington, Kentucky 40515 in there 15 different times. 
that make sense? So I'm gonna click the binocular and it says search by zip code right here where it says search for, I'm gonna type in this zip code that I wanna use for my patient. Again, live system, you're putting in the zip code the patient gives you. When I search for that zip code, I've got two options. I have Lexington, Kentucky and I have Paris, Kentucky. Someone has accidentally put this zip code for Paris, Kentucky, that's not correct. I don't wanna pick the wrong one. If you ever have a list of cities and states when you're using the zip code table and you see Lexington five times, look and make sure you're picking the one that is spelt correctly and never pick a city that is abbreviated. We never abbreviate our cities, okay? So I'm gonna pick the one, the only one that's there, it is correct and I'm gonna click okay. Notice that it filled in my city and my state for me. I didn't have to do that. All right, hit your tab key. It's gonna bring you to home telephone number. Uh, if you go to page 14, uh, it talks about city, state, zip code. It also talks about registering a prisoner. Um, there'll be another video that covers registering a prisoner. Um, if you go to page 15, before we move on to the phone numbers, let's talk about other addresses for patients. So on an existing patient, somebody that's already in the system, if you are, you've scheduled the appointment and you've come to the registration folder to verify their address and you see update address in address one field, it means that we've had returned mail on that patient. So we need to ask them, what is your current address and get that address corrected. Um, unknown address. Um, for existing patients that cannot provide an address at the time of registration or, exist or scheduling, uh, you'll enter unknown in address one field, and then you'll enter the zip code for the city and state that the patient says they live in. For new patients that are unknown and uncommunicative, um, address line one, you'll type the word unknown. Always use proper case, mixed case, make it look professional, okay? So if you're gonna use unknown, you'll capitalize the U in unknown. In address two, address line two, you leave that field blank. Um, and then you will pick the zip code of 40536. That will enter Lexington, Kentucky. That's the UK zip code. We ask that you use that for unknown addresses. If you turn your page to page 16, homeless. If your patient um, says that they are homeless, First, ask them, is there an address for a family member or a P.O. box somewhere where, the, somewhere where you get your mail? If so, use that address. If not, in address one, you're going to type no current address. In address two, you'll type out the word homeless, and then you will use the zip code for the city and state the patient says they're homeless in. Now, another class, someone said, what if they tell you they, they just roam all over? then I would use the UK zip code of 40536, okay? Now, on page 16 in your manual, there's foreign address. Um, we don't have too many patients in here with the foreign address, but foreign addresses don't have cities or zip codes. If you look, I forgot to mention that all these yellow shaded fields anywhere in this registration folder, those are required fields. You cannot leave those fields blank. Uh, you've got to put something in there. There's other fields that are not shaded yellow um, that are UK healthcare required. The yellow shaded are system required. If you don't enter information in there, you can't save it. The other fields are UK healthcare required and we do want you to put information in those fields. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. Um, but if your patient has a foreign address, um, notice that the, the state and the zip code are shaded yellow. When it's a foreign address, you will default the state to Kentucky and the zip code you will enter all zeros, okay? All right, and then on page 16 at the bottom, there is foreign country codes. So if it's a foreign address, you do have to enter the foreign country code in the country field. And there are the codes on page 16. Now, if you go to page 17, phone numbers. <clears throat> There are three phone numbers that we try to capture on every patient. Of course, if they don't have a work telephone number, you're gonna leave it blank. But to the right of telephone, work telephone and cell, do you see these three boxes? Those are phone indicator boxes, but we do not use them here at UK. Um, they have no bearing to anything that we do here at UK. 
Um, now this home telephone number, this is actually where you're gonna enter the best contact phone number for the patient. So you're gonna ask the patient, what is the best contact phone number to reach you at? Most of the time it's gonna be their cell number, okay? So you have to start out with area code first, now in training, you're gonna make this number up and in the live system, you are gonna enter a phone number here based on what the patient tells you. In your manual, if the patient says, I do not have a phone number, you will enter all fives. Um, let me tell you why. This home telephone number is tied into another system we use at UK called Televox. Televox will call or text patients to remind them of their appointments. We get charged for every phone call or every text. If we do not have a valid phone number for the patient, we're gonna use all fives in this field. Don't use all twos or all nines or anything but all fives. Televox will not attempt to call a phone number that is all fives. Call or text a number that's all fives. Uh, so if you cannot get a um, phone number for the patient, you're gonna enter all fives. If you do enter a number and someone attempts to call or text that phone number and we get the, error that that phone number is no longer valid, you will need to change this phone number to all fives. Anytime you come across a patient and you see all fives in the home telephone number field, try to get the best contact phone number for the patient, okay? So you guys go ahead and enter a number in there and then tab twice to the work telephone number. Now our patient is going to be employed. So you can ask the patient, do you have a work telephone number? If they do not, you leave it blank. Um, but we're going to ask our patient, do you have a work telephone number? Yes, I work at UK. Today in training, we're going to enter 859-323-5000. And then tab over to the extension field and type in an extension. And it's usually five digits are, are the extensions we use here at UK. All right, tab to the cell number. The cell number might very well be that home telephone, which is the best contact phone number. If it is, repeat it down here. If it's a different number, enter it down here. Okay? All right, tab to the sex. We only have two options for sex, female or male. Now, you may come across a patient when you ask them what their gender is, um, and they tell you, I do not identify with my birth gender, or they are going through the process to um, transition from one gender to another. We have to go in this field with their birth gender. If we cannot get their birth gender, we will use, we will default it to female. There are more lab tests run on females than there are males. And then on the additional info tab, there is a field there. Don't click on it because you'll get some errors. Um, we'll see it in when we get to that tab. There's a field for gender. You will select unknown gender. Okay. Once the true gender can be determined, um, You'll need to make sure we have the correct gender in the sex field, go to the additional info tab and in the unknown gender, delete that out, okay? So go ahead and pick the uh, sex for your patient, male or female. And then there's the birthday, you can make sure you didn't do a typo, okay? Now employer, click the binocular to the right of the employer and our patient's gonna work at University of Kentucky. I'm gonna type UNIV and hit my enter key. You don't have to type the full name of the employer. Now, University of Kentucky is in here twice. One is right and one is wrong. If you look at abbreviation, you see a bunch of numbers and then you see UK with University of Kentucky with the lowercase UK, that is incorrect. Um, pick the one that has the number. Doesn't matter where you work at UK, what department you're in, what location you work at UK. Um, if you're a UK employee, your work address is room 306 service building. That's where your W-2 comes from. So we're going to select that and click OK. Now, in your manual, it tells you what to do if you search for an employer that's not in the table. So just watch this example. I'm going to click right there and let's say the patient says that they work at Rumkey. If I type that in there and I don't get any um, results for that, I'll click cancel and I need to call the help desk. Now, don't do it right now. Wait till you're finished registering this patient. You might wanna write down their name, their birthday, so you can search for them again, and the name of the employer. Um, call the help desk. Once they get that employer added, they will um, 
I'm not sure how they notify you, if they email you or what. You'll need to come back into this patient's account, click the binocular, search for that employer that was added and select that for the patient, okay? Now, if your patient is a workers' comp patient, they're coming in to be seen for workers' comp, you have to make sure that that employer is filled out. Otherwise, it's gonna cause issues with that workers' comp claim. The other field for workers' comp on the patient tab that you have to make sure is filled out is that employment field. It's not shaded yellow, um, but if it's workers' comp, you have to make sure the employment status is filled out. All right, hit your tab key email. Remember in AHIQA, I uh, showed you some of the warnings that popped up as none for the email address. That's the field that caused that warning. Um, none is a valid response. So if the patient... Okay, on page 17 in your manual, um, we're bottom page 17, email. Now, it says if admin hold patient not eligible for patient portal is in the email address field, that would be on an existing patient. Don't even address that field. Just skip it when you're doing your verification. There's something going on with that patient's account in the patient portal. And until that gets corrected, you don't want to touch that field. Leave that admin hold. Um, once that's been corrected, they will go in there and type in obtain email address, and then you can correct that field, okay? If they're new to UK Healthcare and somebody else is calling in to schedule the appointment, let's say a provider's office is calling in, uh, and they don't gather in patients' email addresses, or I'm calling in for my mother, and gosh, I can't remember what her email address is. Um, you can't leave it blank, it's shaded yellow. You will type in obtain email address, okay? Otherwise, if they're um, an adult age 18 and over, or they're an adolescent who's a parent themselves, you're gonna ask the patient, would you like to be part of the patient portal? That's the only reason this email address field is used. If they say no, you will type the word declined. Make sure you capitalize the D. If they say, I do not have an email address for the patient portal, you will type the word none, capitalize the N in none. If they say, yes, I would like to be part of the patient portal, enter only one email address. They might wanna to try to give you two different email addresses. We can only put one email address in this field, okay? Otherwise it causes issues. This is the only field that you can type whatever punctuation or special character the patient has within their email address. So if they have an underscore or an exclamation point or a number sign within their email address, you can put that here, but you cannot put that in any other field in APM. So for today, for training, I'm just gonna say that um, my patient's email address is their last name, the at sign, I'm gonna say fake, email.com. You guys can put whatever you want in there because it's a training database, but in the live system, you will put exactly what they tell you their email address is. Now, the other example in the manual is if they're an adolescent or a child under 18, you will ask the parent or the guardian, would you like to be part of the patient portal? If they say no, you will type the words Parent refused, capitalize the P in parent and the R in refused, just like it is in the menu. Uh, if they say I don't have an email address, you'll type the word none. If they uh, wanna be part of the patient portal, you'll type in the email address that the parent or guardian provides you with. Once this patient becomes 18, we will then ask the patient if they wanna be part of the patient portal and then go with the examples if they're over 18. Does that make sense? Okay, hit your tab key. It's gonna skip usual provider. We don't use that at UK and it brings you to referring doctor. Do not put a referring doctor in this field, in the registration folder, on the patient tab. Do not put a referring doctor in. If you do, it will attach that doctor to every visit they have at UK, whether it pertains to that visit or not. We put the referring doctor field, and we complete the referring doctor field when we schedule the appointment. So if you look over here, you've got a field for referring doctor. That's where we put the referring doctor and it only attaches them to that visit, okay? Um, PCP, 
is a required field. You cannot leave it blank. If your patient says, I do not have a PCP, I'm gonna click the binocular. If they say I don't have a PCP, I'm gonna search for the word none and I would select none provider, okay? Now, if they give you a PCP's name and you do not find them, by the way, when you're searching for re referring doctor or PCP in the, the tables, only use their last name, nothing but their last name. All are partial, you don't have to do the full last name, but don't use anything else. Uh, because if you look down this list, uh, if I was looking for Christian Fraley and I typed Fraley comma, I would not have found him because that's not how his name is listed. Does that make sense? Same with Eric. If I was looking for Eric and I did Fraley comma, I would not have found him because he's Fraley space MD. And um, so it's best when you're searching for a PCP or referring doctor to just use all or partial last name, okay? Now, I did not find the PCP that I wanted. Um, what I would do is I would go back up here and I would search for a provider. Well, if I could type, and I would select provider not found. Now, in your menu on the top of page 18, if you... Do not find your PCP in the table. You have to select provider not found because you can't leave the field blank. But then you need to send an email to the PM database team. That is highlighted in red on the top of page 19. There is an underscore. It's DL underscore PM database at email.uky.edu. The subject will be PCP not in table. The message will be whatever information you do have for that um, PCP. Do not include patient information in there, okay? You send the email, PM database team gets that. Within 24 to 48 hours, they will get that PCP added to the table. And then they'll respond back to the email that P the PCP has been added. It is your responsibility to come back into this patient's account. So you'll need to write down the patient's name and date of birth so that you can search for them later and secure that somewhere so it's not out in the open for anybody to see. Um, and when you get that email back, and go ahead and write down the PCP's name too on that sticky. So when you get the email back, okay, this PCP has been added. I need to go into this patient's account for the name and birthday I wrote down and go to the PCP field and find that PCP off the table. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. We are going to search for Dr. Halbert. I'm going to type, type H-A-L-B, and I'm going to stop right there. I don't know, does he spell his name E-R-T or A-R-T? And the, the patient's not sure of the spelling either. So I'm just going to do a partial name. I got two options for Dr. Halbert. So I'm going to ask the patient, what is Dr. Halbert's first name? Gee, I don't know. I just call him Dr. Halbert. You might need to look at the address and ask the patient, where are they located? He's located at Tate's Creek Family Practice. So that would be the provider that I want to select, Alan Halbert. So I'm going to select them and click OK. And now I have them in my PCP field. OK? Cannot leave that field blank. Refer to your manual if you can't ever get the information. All right, tab. Marital, employment, and student status are not system-required fields, but they are UK healthcare-required fields. We do want you to get this information. If you ever come across a patient's account that's already in here and you're verifying the information and these fields are blank, please get that information, okay? So if you click the drop down to marital, here's your options for marital. I'm gonna go ahead and say that my patient is married. You pick the option that you want, but my patient has told me they are married. Employment, here are your options for employment. I'm gonna say full-time. Uh, student. Here are your options for student. I'm gonna say they are not a student. You guys pick the options that you want. Just make sure that you complete these fields and in the lab system, it's, it will be based on the information the patient tells you, okay? In activation date, we don't use, it's grayed out anyway. HIPAA statement expiration. We have to have a privacy notice signed by the patient um, and we need one of those signed their lifetime at UK. It does not matter where they signed it so long as we have one signed. And once it's signed, we will scan it into DMS, okay? Document management scanning system that we'll talk about tomorrow when we check a patient in. Now, the HIPAA statement expiration, they're not here to sign the form. They are on the phone. I can't leave that field blank. 
you will put whatever today's date of service is. So I'm just going to click that drop down and double click on today. You could type it in there, but I think it's faster for me to just click the drop down, double click on the date. Okay. All right. Once the patient comes in, when we check that patient in, uh, we will get a pop up that says the HIPAA statement has expired. That's our clue to know I need to hand them a privacy notice, have them sign it and scan it into the MS at check-in. All right, tab to the relation to guarantor. Um, if your patient is a child, this should not say self. Here are your options. If they are over 18, not emancipated, nobody has power of attorney over them, um, they cannot be their own guarantor. If they're under 18, I'm sorry. If they're under 18, not emancipated, nobody has power of attorney over them, they cannot be their own guarantor. If they're over 18, and somebody has power of attorney over them, they can't be their own guarantor. You guys took the WBT for um, guarantor guidelines before you could register for this class. So that talked about who can and cannot be a guarantor, the guarantor rules. So make sure you follow those when you're selecting the guarantor. My patient is over 18. Nobody has power of attorney over them. So they are going to be their own guarantor. I'm gonna select self. Now, it is natural to, once you complete information on one of your tabs, to hit save, but don't do that. If you hit save, you're going to get some hard stop warnings because there's other fields in the tabs that we're going to that are required. You have to enter the information, okay? Instead, you just move to the tabs. So I'm going to click on the account tab. Here's my first encounter with the HIPAA statement on a patient that has not signed their privacy notice yet. Nothing I can do about that. That's a soft stop warning until they come in. When they come in, we'll change that date and it will stop that warning. Once they've signed it, we'll change the date. It'll stop the warning. You just go ahead and click okay. Now it's gonna bring this box up, account bill. If you go to page 20, you'll see that um, screenshot in your manual for the account bill box. Be very careful here. If your child, if your patient is a child, they can be their own guarantor. You want to make sure you uncheck that box. Our patient is their own guarantor, so I'm going to leave that box checked. And I'm going to click OK. All right, so it automatically brought our patient in on the account tab. And it's listed them as the guarantor and the patient because we said they are their own guarantor, okay? Now, bottom of page 20, adding a guarantor. If your patient was a child and you uncheck that box, it would have brought you here. You'd see your patient listed here and the type would only say patient. And then you'd see another entry here that has started for the guarantor. Every patient has to have a guarantor on their account. And if they are a child, then you're going to need to enter the information for the guarantor, the parent or guardian, okay? Uh, it does walk you through on the bottom of page 20 and 21 what you need to complete for the guarantor. I will tell you that even though the Social Security number is not a required field on the account tab, if you're adding someone other than the patient as the guarantor, you need to make sure you get their social security number listed here, okay? All right, um, on page 22, adding the subscriber. So at this point, you're gonna ask the patient, do you have insurance? If the patient says, yes, I've got blue access PPO. Notice that my tab's across the top. To the right of account, the policies tab is grayed out. You have to have a subscriber listed on the account tab before your policies tab is available. In APM, the patient is always going to be the subscriber unless they're less than 30 days old. Uh, in your manual, it does talk to, you, talk to you about what you do if the patient is under 30 days old as far as the policy goes and who would be entered as the subscriber. If you have any questions about that, you call your insurance helpline and they will walk you through what you need to do, okay? Now, we need to add the patient as a subscriber. I want you to watch the screen on this. 
I've got my patient already here. It, the type says patient, guarantor and patient. I will never come down here and check this box and add subscriber to that line. In order to get the billing process to work correctly, we have to have a new line with the patient listed and the type is selected as subscriber so that we can make sure the name matches the plan, birthday matches the plan, social security number matches the plan. So never ever do this. And if you ever come across a patient's account that you see that, you need to fix it. So I'm gonna uncheck that. Now, what you're gonna do is you're gonna click your magic wand. Everybody see their magic wand? You're gonna click that to add a new contact. So I want you to do that. It's gonna automatically start a new contact here. Now down here, you've got your boxes, guarantor, statement, and subscriber. Check the box for subscriber. You're gonna see your patient's last name and subscriber. Now down here, it automatically filled in the patient's last name, address, and phone number. You're gonna ask the patient, how is your last name listed on your insurance plan? If it is misspelled, you will misspell their last name here to make it match. Does that make sense? I'm gonna leave mine as is and say that it does match. Click in the first name field. You're gonna ask them, how is your first name listed on your plan? If it's misspelled on their plan, you misspell it here. I'm gonna go ahead and type in my patient's first name. It's not misspelled. You're gonna ask the patient, is there a middle name or middle initial on your plan? If they say my middle initial is there, you will enter the middle initial in that field. If the middle name is on their plan, you enter the middle name. If it's not, you leave it blank, okay? Now I'm gonna back up here and talk about if this patient had a suffix on their legal name, you know, on the patient tab, we put it with the first name. So we do the first name space, whatever their suffix is. On the account tab, when you're adding the patient as the subscriber, if they have a suffix on their insurance plan, it goes with the last name. So it would be last name space, whatever their suffix is. Does that make sense? So it's reverse of how you would enter it on the patient tab. All right, um, address automatically populates for the patient. I don't need to do anything with that because my subscriber is my patient. Phone number populates. I'm not gonna worry about coming in here and adding the work and the cell number for my patient as the subscriber because I can get it from the patient tab or I can click up here and get it. Um, sex, I do have to answer the sex question. Well, you've already got their gender up here in this header bar. So go ahead and select that. You don't have to ask them again, what, what's your gender? Same with the birthday, but I would say, what birthday does your insurance have listed on your plan? Sometimes there's typos, okay? So you wanna put the birthday in here as the subscriber who is the patient, the way the insurance has their birthday listed. Um, and sometimes patients will know that their birthday is incorrect on their plan. I would highly recommend that they get a hold of that insurance company and get that birthday fixed, okay? Go ahead and enter the birthday for your patient. And again, you can look up in the header bar if they say, well, they're gonna be telling you their birthday anyway. Um, social is not a required field on the account tab, but if you don't put the social here, it doesn't go with that claim when we bill for that visit and we'll get a denied claim if we don't include it. So ask the patient, what is the social they have listed on your plan? If they have refused to give you their social, hopefully they'll give it to you here and then you can go back to the patient tab and change the social security number there. <coughs> Um, go ahead and type in the social that's in the header bar for your patient because that's what their insurance plan has for them. That's all you need when you're adding the patient as a subscriber. I'm going to tab out of that to make sure the field doesn't turn red because sometimes you might end up doing a little boo-boo and not type enough numbers there for the social. It'll turn red. You have to go back and fix it. I don't need to worry about putting the employer in here because I can get that from the patient. Do not put an email address in here. That's only on the patient tab for the patient portal, okay? Any questions about subscriber? All right, um, page 23, to add an emergency contact. Every patient except for a prisoner has to have something listed and flagged as the emergency contact, be it a, patient, a person or something in the place of a person if they say I don't have one. 
In your manual, page 33, patient states they do not have an emergency contact. Um, you will click your magic wand. So let's everybody go ahead and click the magic wand because we're going to add an emergency contact. Um, but in the last name field, if they don't have an emergency contact, you're going to type the words per patient. Capitalize the P and per, the key and P and patient. The first name will say none. You'll enter none. Address one, you'll type the word unknown. And then um, you can leave the city and state the way it is. Um, take out uh, an address, too, if there is one in there. Phone number, you're going to change that to all fives. Okay. The sex will be whatever the sex of the patient is. And the birthday will be one default birthday that we use in the place of a birthday we can't get. That is 0101 1900. Okay. You don't need a social security number on an emergency contact. Don't need um, on this example. That's all you need. Okay. Now, if your patient does have an emergency contact, then you need to put in the last name of the emergency contact. Now, I'm gonna be a little lazy in training and say that my patient's emergency contact is their spouse, so they have the same last name. I'm gonna leave that last name. So when I click my magic wand and start adding a new contact, it pulled in the patient's last name, address, and phone number. I'm gonna say the last name is the same for the emergency contact. I'm gonna click in the first name field and I'm gonna type out the first name of the emergency contact. Not worried about a middle name or middle initial on an emergency contact. I just need their name, okay? But the same applies if their name has an apostrophe in it or if they have a hyphen in it. Don't use those. Follow the same naming conventions you would use on any patient. Address. If the emergency contact does not live with the patient, you want to change the address. Let's leave it in training for today, okay? They live together. Now, Phone number, I want you to click in that home telephone number field. That is the best contact phone number for the patient. That's not the same number for the emergency contact. So click in that field and start typing a new area code. You will get this box that pops up. Anytime you get a box that pops up, please read it. Don't just click OK and move on. Uh, in this case, the correct radio dial is selected. I only want to change the phone number for this contact that I'm adding. If I change the radio dial to all contacts with this address, it's going to change the patient's phone number too. And I don't want to do that. I just want to change that phone number to the emergency contact. So this contact only. Go ahead and click OK. And then you can finish adding the emergency contacts phone number. If you can get a work telephone number for the emergency contact, that's great. Put it in there. I'm going to say that there's not a work number available. They're not allowed to have phone calls at work. Call their cell number. Cell number, same thing. If this home telephone is the cell number, go ahead and repeat it down here. If it's different, of course, you type in the cell number there. You have to have the sex of the emergency contact. They'll know whether it's male or female, okay? If for some reason they do not know the birthday of the emergency contact, you'll enter 0101-1900. I'm gonna put in a birthday. And then I'm going to hit my tab key to make sure that field doesn't turn red. You do not need a social security number on an emergency contact, so leave it blank. We don't need to worry about getting that. We only need it on the patient, and because the patient is the subscriber, we need it on the subscriber. Uh, employer, if you got a work telephone number, you might want to click the binocular and go find that employer. Um, email. Do not put anything in that field. We only put the email address in on the patient tab in that field for the patient portal, okay? Now, you do need to come down here and check the box for emergency contact. When you do that, you get this pop-up that says, make this person the new emergency contact. I'm going to say yes. And then you have to pick the relationship of the emergency contact. Um, you can't pick the relationship until you flag them as the emergency contact. So you're gonna click that drop down. Here are your options. If the option for the emergency contact is not listed here, you will pick other. Anytime you pick other, you have to come in the comment section and type out what that relationship is. And I'm gonna say my emergency contact is the spouse, okay? Any questions on adding an emergency contact? All right, we're gonna move on to the policy staff. Now, if you go to page 25, 
Um, it tells you that when we're adding a plan, some of these fields we don't complete. For instance, that field that says MSQ reason code um, or verified date, we don't use those, okay? So don't ever put anything in there. If your patient has workers' comp, you have to make sure that on the patient tab, you had that employer field completed and the employer status completed. Um, and when it's a workers' comp or a motor vehicle, when you schedule the appointment, there is an ailment field that you have to complete. But when you're adding that motor vehicle or workers' comp plan to the policy, you do not attach the ailment to the policy. It will not stay attached as it flows downstream through to the billing system. It only stays attached when you attach it on the appointment. So don't ever attach it in the policies tab. Now it says for Medicare patients, at check-in, you have to complete the, the MSPQ who's available for interview and the MSPQ questionnaire, uh, the reason why they're eligible for Medicare. You took the WBT, Medicare, Medicare replacement and MSPQ. So you can always refer back to that WBT, but if you ever have any questions about any patient's insurance plan, call the insurance helpline. Okay. Uh, for prisoners, if your patient is a prisoner, you will add the prison plan as their primary policy uh, and not their health insurance. We will bill the prison for their visit. The prison will then turn around and bill the um, patient's insurance if they have any. On page 26, here's your newborn registration process. Um, I'm not actually going to go through all of that, but please follow these examples if your patient um, is younger than 30 days old. Uh, Medicaid and MCO for a newborn is listed there. TRICARE Prime and Standard for a newborn is listed there. Um, and it says, please contact the insurance helpline at 218-5915 if you have any questions about insurance plans or AIM, how to find that plan in AIM, the Automated Insurance Manual. So at this point in the live system, you would have already logged into AIM and you would go into AIM. Patient said they have blue access PPO. The plan is actually uh, an Anthem plan. So you would look in AIM under Anthem, look for blue access PPO and get that plan code. You need the plan code before you can enter it here in APM, okay? Um, so this patient, is going to have blue access PPO. So we're gonna click our binocular to start adding a new policy. When you do that, coverage defaults to primary. I want you to click the drop down and look at the options. This coverage stands for coordination of benefit. What order is this insurance plan going to be billed? If they have two plans, you need to ask the patient which one is primary and put that one in first and then add the other one as a secondary plan. Okay, so we're gonna leave that as primary. I want you to look up here under policy information. You've got a column that says coverage. It says primary, and then you have a coverage type. Right now it says new because we haven't picked it yet. This coverage type is tied in with the appointment. What coverage type did you use to schedule that appointment or what coverage type are you gonna use for that appointment? Coverage type means what are they coming in to be seen for? Is it a medical appointment? Is it a motor vehicle appointment, a worker's comp, research? Does that make sense? So when you add the plan, you have to make sure you're putting the correct coverage type. So where it says insurance, you're gonna click that binocular to the right. It's gonna bring the insurance carrier plan lookup, okay? Now, it's always gonna, you need to always search by abbreviation. That's the plan code. If you put the plan code in the search for field and that says carrier name, you're gonna not find it, you're, you may get an error, okay? So if it doesn't default to abbreviation, then I would check this box, save search by setting. So the next time you log in, it's gonna hold that abbreviation. Now, before you put the plan code in, you need to look at that cover site. It always defaults to medical. We are doing a medical appointment. So we want that cover type to be medical. But if I was doing a motor vehicle or workers comp, I would need to change that cover type right here to motor vehicle or workers comp. Does that make sense? Okay. 
In the search for a field, I'm going to type YRP because I looked in AIM and Blue Access PPO, the plain code is YRP. So I enter it there and I either click search or hit my enter key. And here's my Blue Access PPO. Now, remember in AHIQA, we saw a couple of plans that had an asterisk in front of it. You might see that here. Do not pick the one that has the asterisk. If that's your only option, you need to go back to A and relook that plan up. If you can't find it or you're having problems with it, you call the insurance helpline and they'll assist you with that. Um, but we have blue access PPO, so I'm going to single click to select that. All right, you're going to ask the patient, what is your PCP copay? It doesn't matter if you're in a PCP office, you're going to select both copays for this plan when you enter it. If you're in a specialist office, you're going to select both copays. Okay, so you're going to ask the patient, what is your PCP copay? Actually, I have coinsurance, I don't have a copay. So I'm going to select the coinsurance plan or no copay for my PCP. I'm going to come down here under specialist and do the same thing coinsurance plan or no copay. They have a copay, uh, a coinsurance instead of a copay. Does that make sense? So when they come in, they don't pay a copay, they get a bill for coinsurance, like 20% of whatever that office visit is or whatever it is under their plan. And I'm going to click OK. It's going to bring you back out here. Okay. And you see the insurance is blue access PPO. There's the address and there's the copay information that you entered. We don't have one because they don't have a copay. They have coinsurance. Do not fill out MSP reason code. Do not attach an ailment. Um, employer, don't worry about putting that on the policy stack. Effective date. You're going to ask the patient, what is the effective date on your plan? If it's on the card, you enter the effective date that's on the card. If there's not one on the card and the patient doesn't know, doesn't know the effective date, you put the first day of the current month that you're in. So I'm going to type 0301 2021 because it's not on their card and they can't remember their effective date. Once we get the results back from the next bar on this patient that came directly from the payer, we will match that effective date to the plan date that comes back from experience from that plan, okay? All right, a sign always should default to yes. If it does not default to yes, you need to call the insurance helpline. It has to be yes. If it's not, then there's something wrong with that and they need to get that corrected or we pick the wrong plan. Uh, expiration date, unless that patient no longer has this insurance, do not put an expiration date in there. Sometimes um, people want to put an expiration date on Medicaid because it's usually only good from month to month. Don't do that. Leave that effective date, uh, expiration date um, alone, leave it blank, uh, so that we don't have to re-enter this plan every month. Does that make sense? Verified date, we don't use. Subscriber. Who is the subscriber? The patient. You're going to click that drop down, and there's your patient that you listed on the account tab as the subscriber on a line all by itself. So go ahead and select that. And then um, cert number. You're going to ask the patient, what is your um, ID number, plan number, identification number, whatever it's called, policy number. For today in training, I want you to type capital YRP, and then go ahead and type the patient social because some plans will have letters and numbers, okay? But again, this cert number is what you're going to match to the member ID code that you get resulted back from the payer in Experian. Now, patient's relationship. It wants to know what is the patient's relationship to the subscriber? Who is the subscriber listed here? It's the patient, right? So this will always say yes, uh, self, sorry, not yes, <laughs> self, patient is the subscriber. That is going to cause confusion within APM, and you're going to get a pop-up with a soft stop warning about the patient's, um, it'll say patient warning invalid data entered for patient's relationship. That's a good soft stop warning. It means you've got that subscriber on a line all by itself, who is the patient and you've selected that subscriber, not any other contact as the subscriber, and that is the patient. Um, now, 
in order to get this kicked off to Experian, we haven't done anything to get that kicked off to Experian. We couldn't schedule the appointment first. Uh, when you schedule the appointment first, that's what kicks it off to Experian. So what we wanna do is we have entered this plan. Now this will also go, um, you'll wanna do this if you got an existing patient and their insurance plans have changed or you've added a plan. While you're on the policies tab, you wanna hit the save button. So hit your save button. It's going to give you a soft stop warning about the HIPAA, just click okay. And then it's gonna give you some hard stop warnings. These fields are on the additional info tab that we're gonna to have to go to to complete this registration. Go ahead and click okay. But that is gonna cause it to kick out to Experian. So we're gonna to go to the additional info tab and fill out that information there that's needed. And then we'll come back to the policies tab and then verify our information, change what we need to to match Experian on that plan. And then we're actually finished with the registration folder. Does that make sense? So we're gonna to go to the additional info tab. You're gonna get your invalid relationship in, was entered for patient's relationship for this insurance plan. That's the good soft stop I was telling you about. Um, go ahead and click okay. It's gonna bring you to the additional info tab. Now we're gonna fill out these fields, but we are not gonna hit save when we're done. We wanna go back to the policies tab. Our patient will be resulted in the live system on the next bar in training, we won't have a patient's name there. I have to go find one to show you how that works together. But in the live system, once you get back to the policies tab, your patient will be resulted here. You will click on CV and go match the coverage that comes back for that plan. All right, A and A consent, they are not here um, to sign that A and A. So I'm gonna click in that field just to put my cursor there. And then I'm gonna hit my tab key um, twice. You're gonna come to date of death. In your manual, on page 27, if you get information on an existing patient that they have passed away, you will not enter a date of death. You will instead email the ambulatory scheduling office on the top of page 28 in blue is their email address. And it tells you to include in the email the patient's name, date of birth, medical record number. Um, it says or patient ID, but we really don't use patient ID in APM here at UK, uh, date of death if available, and who informed you that that patient had passed away. You send that email to them. They'll go through the process to confirm that the patient has in fact passed away. And then they start taking care of things on the back end. If there's any future appointments, they will go in there and get those canceled, um, start the process to complete the billing on any visits that are outstanding, things like that. Um, so don't ever, Put a day to death in here. If your patient has passed away, you will send an email to the ASO office. Okay. Race. If you look in your manual, um, there is the five race codes there, and it tells you race one is required. I want you to click the drop down. So if the patient is biracial, we don't have an option for biracial. You have to pick their race off of here. If they're biracial, you will go to race two and enter their other race. Does that make sense? Okay. If they don't have, if they're not biracial, you skip all the other race fields and you have up to five fields to enter all the right, right uh, excuse me, races that the patient may have. Ethnicity. Uh, you can click the drop down. Now in the live system, this unreported and refused to report are two separate options, but in training it's lumped together. Uh, they're either Hispanic, Latino, not Hispanic, Latino, you can't get the information, so it's unreported, or they refuse to give you their ethnicity. I'm gonna go ahead and pick um, not Hispanic for my patient. You guys pick the choice, but again, you're in the live system, you'll pick what the patient tells you. Primary language, I'm gonna tab there and type an E. Uh, there are 68 different languages on that dropdown. You can go find their primary language if it's not English, but if it is English, just type an E and that's what you'll get. Interpreter needed, there's only two options, yes or no. They don't, if they don't need one for hearing or language, they don't need an interpreter. So I'm gonna say, nope, they don't need an interpreter. Patient, AKA alias, this is their preferred name. What name do they prefer to go by? On the patient tab, we have to put their legal name in. What if my patient goes by their middle name? I could put their middle name there. My son's name is Charles, he goes by Chaz. On the patient tab, it says Charles. 
but here on the additional info, it says Chaz, okay? Um, alias one, two, three, and four are for legal name changes. Um, so if the patient has had a name change, it's an existing patient, you'll come to the registration folder, search for the patient. You'll go directly to the additional info tab. Your patient's name will be listed right here in the header bar. Down in the alias one, two, or three, whichever field is available, depending on how many times they've changed their name, you will enter the last name, comma, first name, as it appears up here, no space. Last name, comma, first name, nothing else. <coughs> then you go back to the patient tab and you change the name there to what their current name is. You document their legal name as it is in the system now, before the change here on the additional info tab, and then you go to the patient tab and change the name. Document it first and then go change it. Um, and you have up to four fields for name changes. Religion, check with your department to see if your department gathers the religion, religion information. If so, then you document it there. Maiden name, all females, we need their maiden name and it's last name only. So I'm just gonna make up a maiden name for my patient because I have a female. Mother's maiden name, last name only on all patients. If they tell you, I don't know what my mother's maiden name is, you can type the word unknown. Just document that you've at least asked. Otherwise, go ahead and put in the mother's maiden name, last name only. <coughs> father's first name. What is the father's first name? If they say, I have no idea, you type the word unknown. Otherwise, you just type the father's first name only. Contact preference on page 29. Um, this is what tells Televox to either call or text the patient to remind them of their appointments, okay? Now, UK Healthcare prefers that we text patients their appointments because it's a little bit cheaper for us to send that text than it is to make that phone call. So in the live system under contact preference, you would select by text, but you, please ask the patient, would you like to get your appointment reminders by text or by phone? So if they want them by text, you select by text. If they say, no, I prefer to have a phone call. In the live system, it says instead of by phone that it says in training, it says phone confirmed. So you will select that, okay? Now, if they are a prisoner or they don't want phone calls or texts, you will select do not contact. So go ahead and pick a choice for your patient. I'm gonna say by text. Before we move on, I do wanna talk about um, one thing. If you go to page 30 in your manual, now, if the patient previously wanted their um, appointment reminders by text and then they come in and they've opted out, they no longer want them by text, they want them by phone call or do not contact. And then they come back later and say, I want texts again. Um, you could change that to text there, but it's not going to change it within Televox. What the patient will have to do is send a text message to the number 622-622, and that's in your manual. Um, and that will, the message that they send to that number will say UKHC, and that will actually get them opted back in to start receiving those texts again. So if it says by phone or do not contact and you change it to by text, it will not change it on Televox's end. The patient has to go that next step and text that number UKHC to that phone number, 622-622. Make sense? All right, here's the gender field I was talking about. On the patient tab, if we can't get their birth gender, we select female, you select unknown gender here. If the patient is a prisoner, you will select prisoner. If there's child custody issues going on, you will select custody. And then you might wanna have a patient note stating that there's a child custody issue going on. Um, KHIE stands for Kentucky Health Information Exchange. We don't, we're not using that anymore here at UK. We're not bringing anybody that's not already using it live because we are transitioning over to EPIC. Um, so we've kind of stopped using that option. Okay. Now, before we hit save, I want to go back to my policies tab because I entered this plan brand new and I hit save to kick it off to experience. So at this point in the live system, on the next bar, you would have the patient's name, okay? 
you would click on the button that says CV. But for training purposes, I have to click on the work queue and go find a patient. So bear with me just one moment. Okay. Doesn't matter how many times their name's listed here, always pick the top one and you'll learn that in your experience training. So just to recap here, when I got back to the policies tab, my patient's name would have been up here. I clicked on CV and it would have brought me right here. Okay. Well, this patient doesn't have blue access PPO anymore. <laughs> They've got Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield, but it's the Kentucky State employee. But we're going to say that this is their insurance for, like for training purposes. I'm just showing you the fields you're matching. Does that make sense? This in Experian is a live patient with real information. This in training in APM is in the training database. It's a fake patient. So yes, it's not going to match. But in the live system, you want to make sure these, these fields match. Okay. So they have one coverage. It's the uh, Anthem Kentucky State employee. There it is right there. I would click on my response. If I've already set up, customized what I want to see, that's where I want to go. First, I want to look at these copays. Remember I said the patient said they don't have a copay, they have coinsurance. If you look at this plan, they have coinsurance. So that matches. I put that in there correctly. If this did have a copay dollar amount that was different from what I entered over here, to fix that, you would come over to APM, click that binocular, it'll bring up that plan. You go pick the copays that match Experian. And when you click OK, it'll change it. Okay? Well, where's my Experian? There we go. Sorry. All right, so I've looked and matched my copay information. Then I want to look at my plan here, and I want to look at my plan date. So this says 1-1-2015 is what that plan effective date is. In APM, that would be the date I want to make sure it says. So if these dates didn't match, the plan date from Experian didn't match what I have in APM for the same patient, I would change the date in Experian to match, I'm sorry, in APM to match what Experian came back with. I'm not gonna do that because again, this is a live patient and this in APM is a fake patient. Um, then I would go up to my patient and I wanna look at this name. Now in Experian, the name comes back, last name, comma, space, first name, space, middle name or middle initial if there is one. But in APM, your subscriber is listed as first name, space, middle name or middle initial, space, last name. That's okay. We don't put commas in APM. What you do want to do is look at that first name. Does it match exactly the first name of the subscriber spelt exactly the same way? If it is, you're good. If there's a middle initial, you need to make sure that middle initial is on the subscriber name or middle name. Last name, does that last name match exactly with the last name? And look at that. I have the same patient's last name. Go figure. Um, but you wanna make sure the patient's last name also matches. Does that make sense? Now, if for some reason, this patient name did not, or this name in Experian did not match my subscriber name, I would go to my account tab. I'm gonna click okay. Go to my account tab, click on my subscriber and change the name under the subscriber to match what it says in Experian. And then when I go back to my policies tab, it'll automatically update it here for me. Does that make sense? The patient name or the name under the patient column in Experian has to match the subscriber name exactly. All right. And then this member ID code, you want to make sure that matches the CERT number in APM. Again, you could copy that out of Experian and paste it into APM if you wanted to. And then you want to look at the group name. Make sure that group name matches the group name in APM. If you've got something in Experian for group name, but nothing in APM, copy it out of Experian and paste it into APM. If you've got something in APM and there's nothing in Experian, delete it out of APM. Does that make sense? Group ID, make sure that matches the group number field in APM. And again, you can copy and paste it. 
and I'm finished with what I need to, the fields I need to verify from Experian to my policies to have an APM for this patient's insurance. So I'm just gonna hit the X to close Experian for that patient. I'm still in the next bar. I've not logged out of the next bar, I just closed the coverage for that patient. Now we did make some changes. When we went to the additional info tab, we made some changes. We wanna hit save now. So everybody hit save. It says warning, your HIPAA expired. That's okay, that tells me when they come in for their visit, I'm gonna have them sign a privacy notice. Click okay. You get your invalid relationship warning. That's the good soft stop. It means we've got the subscriber in and we've confused the system because the patient is listed as the subscriber. So click okay. It's gonna save all of that, kick you out, bring you back to your scheduling folder where you get your HIPAA statement again, you're gonna click okay. You're now ready to schedule the appointment. Okay, so now we're ready to schedule the appointment, but let's refresh just a second before we move on and schedule. Um, we looked for our patient. They wanted to come in and establish care, told us they had never been seen anywhere at UK before. So we went through the process to create the registration folder because they were not already in the system, we had to create that registration folder first. Um, we started in scheduling, search for our patient. We clicked the new patient button when we didn't get any results from our searches. It took us to the registration folder through a companion window. We filled out everything in that registration folder. Once we completed that and saved, it brought us back to our scheduling folder where we will now schedule the appointment. If you have an existing patient, you search for the patient, you find them within APM, you schedule the appointment first, and then you go to the registration folder and you verify everything. So it's kind of a little backwards when it's a brand new patient. You have to have that registration folder first. So once you turn your manual page 32, that starts the scheduling section of the manual. Now it does say that um, you can't schedule outside of your own department unless you've been sanctioned to do so. So unless you're gonna do ancillary testing for some other department, you're allowed to schedule those appointments. <clears throat> you won't schedule for any department other than your own. The exception to that will be lab appointments. Your provider uh, wants the patient to go to the lab. It's your responsib responsibility to schedule a lab appointment for them. Um, now, when it comes to scheduling the appointment, the first thing you wanna do is look at this coverage type. On page 32 in the manual, the coverage types are listed with the definitions of when you would use each of these. Um, this appointment is gonna be a medical appointment because it falls under medical. They wanna come in and establish care with a, a new PCP. So that will be medical. So we're gonna leave our coverage type as medical, which means unless it's motor vehicle or workers comp, you do not need an ailment, okay? Now, what I want you to do, since we don't have our scheduled department fault defaulted in like you would in the live system, do not click the drop down to the right of scheduling department. Instead, just click in that field and type an F. You will get family and community medicine. So schedule department field, click in the field and type an F. And then hit the arrow down key on your keyboard one time. Make sure that that scheduled department says family and community medicine, uh, Turflin. Tab to the location and type an F. We wanna put this on the green key. So I'm gonna hit my arrow down key until I find Family Community Medicine Green Turflin. I actually only had to click it twice. You're gonna to tab to your resource and we're gonna schedule this with Dr. Fonz. So type F-A-W and you can stop right there. I just started typing the provider's last name and it actually defaulted in who I want, wanted before I had to type the whole name. Again, remember when you're looking for a resource or a PCP or a referring doctor, just start typing the last name. Tab to the appointment type. Um, Dr. Fons for this appointment, this is a new patient. So I'm gonna type an N. Now, Dr. Fons in the training database. Her new patient appointment types are set up on 20 minute blocks. So that's why you see new patient 20 minutes. Your provider might have their appointment types set up on different durations, like their established might be a 15 minute block or a 30 minute block. Um, just depends on that specific provider. 
They might have two appointment types with the same name, but different durations. You're gonna to need to know when you're scheduling an appointment, which one of those you're going to use. Now, if for some reason they have one appointment type and the duration is not long enough for the appointment they want for the patient, um, you'll need to come down in the duration field and change that. Now, we're not gonna change it, but I do wanna say anytime you come down to duration and add more time, notice that her new patient appointments are set up on 20 minute blocks. If she tells me I need 30 minutes with this patient, I would change my duration to 40. I would double whatever is here because her appointments are set on 20 minute blocks. If I put in a 30 minute duration, I will mess up the rest of her schedule for the rest of the day. It's gonna throw all of those off. So I wanna keep in line with her actual durations. So I would just double that. It may give her a little more time with the patient, but it'll keep her schedule on track, okay? If there is a doctor that referred the patient for this visit, you're gonna to have to click the binocular and go find that referring doctor. Any follow-up appointments um, that pertain to this same issue until it's resolved and there's a referring doctor, you have to add the referring doctor to each of the follow-up appointments. But for this visit, there was a referring doctor. We're gonna click that binocular and it was actually Dr. Alan Halbert at Tate's Creek Family Practice. I'm gonna type H-A-L-B-E-R-T because I know how to spell his name. Otherwise, I would just do partial. And when I click search or hit enter, there's Dr. Alan Halbert, Tate's Creek Family Practice. I'll click on him to select him and click OK. Now in the comment section, it's extremely important that you always, always put the chief complaint, the reason for the visit. This comment section will flow to AEHR on the daily tab. The last column there is the comments. That's how those comments get to AEHR from this field right here. We need to know why is the patient coming in. And remember, do not use punctuation or special characters whatsoever anywhere except for where I've told you before in the registration folder. The exception to that in the scheduling folder is right here in this comment section. You can use the forward slash, but don't use any other punctuation. So if you were doing a follow-up appointment, instead of typing FU, space and whatever they're coming in to be seen for, it doesn't look very good. You could do F forward slash U and the reason that they're coming in. Now, you don't have to write a book about why they're coming in. You can just abbreviate, but make sure you use standard abbreviation, uh, but put enough information um, where the, anybody looking at it will know why the patient's coming in. This patient wants to come in and uh, to establish care. So I'm just gonna do EST space care. Now, Days and times will automatically always populate today's date in the on or after field. When you're scheduling appointments, unless this appointment is not needed for two weeks or further out, leave that date. Always give the patient the first available opening because even though it says March 24th, 2021 here, when we click open times, we will get the first available appointment this provider has in their schedule for that location that you've selected and that appointment type. It might not be until three months out, but it will show you the first available appointment. And also when the open times window pops up, it will give you two weeks worth of appointments within that window. And if the first date that pops up is not convenient for the patient, you can scroll down and find other dates within two weeks. If none of those work, there's a button that says more times you click on that and it takes you to the next two weeks worth of appointments. Now, for training purposes, I want you to schedule this appointment for tomorrow. So you can either click in that field and change that date, or you can click the drop down and double click on tomorrow's date. And then I want you to click the button at the bottom that says open times. This is where your open times window comes up, and you will see all of the available uh, days and times from March 25th, the date that we put in that field through April 4th. If none of those work, you're gonna click more times. It'll give you the next two weeks worth of appointments. So you see all of the available appointment times for the next two weeks, if you were to scroll down, okay? Now I do wanna say that when you're scrolling, do you see a difference in color here? <clears throat> that just means that you're moving from one day to the next. So be aware of that. 
Um, you don't want to end up picking a different day than what you're actually looking for. All right, go ahead and pick a time on there for tomorrow and then click schedule and stop right there. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. All right, so once you've picked your day and time, you're going to get the schedule appointment box. It's just a confirmation. You can look at it and make sure you've got everything right. You can even uh, repeat to the patient, okay, I've got you scheduled for Thursday, March 25th, 11.40 a.m., whatever time you've picked uh, with Dr. Fons in your department. You might also tell them if you've got a script kind of that you give patients or say to patients, please make sure you arrive 15, 20 minutes early. Um, bring a list of all of your medications, things like that, okay? Now, there's some boxes down here. We only use one or maybe two of these boxes. Print the appointment reminder. Check with your department um, to see if there's like the medical record section that will uh, batch print out appointment reminders. If you need to print this appointment reminder, if you've scheduled the, the appointment less than two weeks from now, and then put it in an envelope, and mail it out. Check with your manager about your process there. Um, referral required. We've already been to the registration folder on the policy tab, looked in AIM, found out all the details. We know whether a referral is required per that insurance at this point. We could check that box if it was. This wait list box, do not ever check the wait list box. Um, if your department uses a wait list, and you check this box, you know how in AEHR, they're on the daily tab and appending status for that day until they actually come in. They get checked in through APM and acknowledged. If you check the wait list box here, it will never change them from pending to arrived in AEHR. Instead, um, once you've scheduled the appointment, you will then go to appointment activity. This appointment will be listed. You right click on it, select wait list there, and that will schedule your appointment. I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. And you are actually finished scheduling that appointment. Now, this first one does take just a minute. So. so once you schedule the appointment, you can see that appointment right here in this section, all future appointments, not only your department, that they have at UK will be listed here. You can't do anything with it. If you need to do something with one of those appointments, you would go to appointment activity and take care of it there. All right, that concludes how to register a patient who is brand new to UK and schedule an appointment.